Hello and welcome back to Protect Life here at Breaking the Consensus. Uh, before we get started, I'd first like to invite you to hit the like and subscribe buttons there so that any new material, any new videos or, or uh, new essays that we have, we'll, you'll be advised of them. Also, the donate button is there. Anything that you can give us, we will, will be much appreciated and we can promise you it will be used to the best of our abilities in the campaigns that we are engaged in. And they are many, sadly, that we have to fight. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome Peter Williams, who is across the water. I think he joins from Watford, I think, tonight. Peter works with the Anskin Centre, which is a very uh, well-known, very prominent uh, ethics uh, as well, research centre in the United Kingdom. And we'll be talking about euthanasia tonight, which is very much on our minds over here. There have been a number of bills uh, doing the rounds of the doll, a couple of private member bills, which have probably been withdrawn on the basis that something is going to be produced by the government. And we wait with not much optimism uh, about the nature of the content. But to, so before we get into it, Peter, I'd like just for the sake of the audience, there are certain kinds of phrases that we hear and are used a lot in, in this discourse that are maybe are not always clear. Uh, and maybe not, maybe that's a, a, a policy choice on, on behalf of people. So we, we talk about euthanasia generally, but there's, we tend to div divide it into different types, shall we say. There's active euthanasia, passive euthanasia. More and more, we, we don't hear the word euthanasia at all. It's, we, we talk about assisted suicide. Um, as you, you were saying to me off there, we're moving now from assisted suicide to assisted dying. Then you have what I, I would think most Christians and Catholics would not agree as the same thing, which is the withdrawal or the withholding of extraordinary measures. So if you could just address those and talk, have, uh, give us an idea of what we're talking about here. Certainly. So, uh, by, by the way, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be with you and thank you, those who are watching. Uh, I hope this is an edifying uh, presentation and evening and, and conversation. Um, so, yeah, what we're talking about generally when we talk about the issues that are raised by the recent Kenny Bill or by the various kinds of legislation that has been introduced in, well, either Ireland or the British Isles or elsewhere, uh, particularly the kind of countries that have legalised the uh, killing of uh, patients who are terminally ill or vulnerable. What we're talking about is euthanasia and assisted suicide, EAS as we call it in the Anscombe Centre. Um, now, the difference between those two things is important. Euthanasia is the deliberate killing of a patient by the physician. So if a doctor were to take a syringe of some lethal poison and inject the patient with it so as to kill them, um, or was to do some other action that led to the death of the patient, ostensibly for the sake of the re uh, release of suffering, then that is euthanasia, formally speaking. But assisted suicide is slightly different. Assisted suicide is when someone, the doctor, usually the physician, gives the patient the means to end their own life. Uh, in other words, gives them the uh, the, the plunger the, or the um, whatever device it is that ingest, it injects or rather allows them to ingest uh, the poison that will kill them, the barbiturates, maybe you just give them the barbiturates in pill form, whatever it is, that is assisted suicide. You are assisting someone else to end their own life. So whoever it is who ends the life of the patient, that's the difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide. And of course, when we talk about euthanasia, we can talk about active euthanasia, which is precisely the killing of the patient, or passive euthanasia, where the patient's life is ended by virtue of the, the, the doctor not doing something, not giving them the help they need or not giving them whatever care that they need. Uh, and this can, of course, be very deliberate. This can be direct passive euthanasia or there's indirect passive euthanasia as well. But these that's a sort of side issue to this. What we're really talking about when we talk about the legal changes, the legislation that have been proposed by people like uh, uh, by, by Kenny et al, is formal euthanasia or assisted suicide. And there's an interesting history around this. It used to be in, in Great Britain, it used to be in the United Kingdom, that when we discussed this whole issue, we were talking about euthanasia per se. So when they tried to introduce the first euthanasia bill in 1936, that's as, as early as it gets with us in the United Kingdom, um, the Voluntary Euthanasia Society had just been founded by Charles Killick Millard and others. And that was actual euthanasia. The idea was that they wanted to allow doctors to do what uh, the doctor of, of George, King George V did, which was actually end his life towards the very end of his life, poisoning. But that changed in the 2000s. So when there was a, an introduction of a bill 
um, in the House of Lords, which would have actively introduced voluntary euthanasia. But that failed. It was There was a change in tack by the euthanasia lobby to say, OK, look, we can't get euthanasia through. People don't like this idea of euthanasia, but maybe they will accept the uh, nose of the camel under the tent. Maybe they'll just accept assisted suicide, in other words, giving the patient the right, the ability to end their own lives, um, and only for terminally ill patients. So they've gone very, very, very moderate. They're trying to introduce the most moderate change they possibly can. Because once you've introduced the change, particularly once you've introduced the change on the basis of their premises, that is to say that there is such a thing as the right to die, based on this idea that personal autonomy and that personal autonomy uh, the ability of us of us to do things and to run our own lives and to be free that that extends to the right to be able to uh, be enabled to kill yourself to, to be able to end your own life once you've once you've granted that premise it's very hard to say well actually we we should just stop there only only assisted suicide with the terminally ill they will say that they'll say look we're only looking for assisted suicide with the terminally ill but the logic of their position really much more logically, well, much more rationally, extends to people who are in much harder cases than the person who's got, let's say, four weeks to live because they have a terminal condition. It much more readily applies to people who, for example, are in uh, states whereby they are um, paralyzed, let's say. So they, they have a paralysis of some description due to an injury. Uh, like Tony Licklinson, you might know the famous case of Tony Licklinson, who was a, a rugby player or a player, guy who played rugby in any case, but he had a catastrophic in injury. Uh, and due to that catastrophic, catastrophic injury, he was paraplegic. Now, if you're in that state, you are locked in, um, or you are, you are completely disabled, then there is literally nothing you can do. You can communicate by some, some very you know, some means eventually, but you are completely unable to do anything else. And that must be horrific. Absolutely, we can't get, we can't, we should not um, try to pretend otherwise. There are some conditions that are genuinely quite horrific, but that's not so much an issue of pain as it's often presented. It's more an issue of utter inability to do anything and therefore the emotional suffering that comes from such a, a terrible condition. So if you were going to argue for, for uh, the right to end your own life, surely it would extend much more readily, readily to people like that than it would for people who are um, simply terminally ill who will die in the next few weeks. But that's where they've started. Mm -hmm. They've done that very deliberately and very, very ethical reason. Um, so what you have to do is you have to interrogate, I think, not only what they're doing and what the logical consequences of this would be if it were extended later, you also have to interrogate, I think, the premises that they have per se. And of course, the most fundamental premise that they have is this idea of autonomy, as I've said, the right to die, uh, the ability to do things. And the idea is that if you have bodily autonomy, if you have the right over your own life to, to decide what to do with your own life, as we all generally believe, we accept as a general principle, then they will argue, well, surely that should extend to the right to end your own life. That, that is the ultimate self-possession, the, the right to decide how you want to end your own life. But of course, that's not necessarily the case at all. All autonomy, all personal autonomy is limited, not only according to the effect it has on us, but also the effect it has on other people, whether directly or indirectly. And the, the, I use this in plenty of uh, bioethical discussions, of course, it becomes very much, uh, it's, it's very relevant in the whole abortion debate, as we saw, but it's very relevant here in a, in a more extended way. The, the example that I use to kind of point against this idea of autonomy extending quite that far is you know, my right to move my hand through the air, my right to, my right to bodily autonomy in that sense stops when it reaches your face. My right to shout at the top of my lungs stops mm -hmm. when it begins to disturb my neighbours. Um, and you can go further with that. You know, it's not just a direct effect, it's also a, or even an indirect effect. It can be something like my right to access certain drugs. So, for example, if I want to have uh, antibiotics, the doctor has the is the gatekeeper of, of, of antibiotics. I think that's true in Ireland as much as it is in the United Kingdom. Yes. And, and the doctor will say, if you don't have a serious enough condition, well, no, I'm not going to give you the antibiotics. Well, why? Surely it's my right to medical autonomy. Well, no, it's not, because if you just give out antibiotics like candy, like 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 sweets, then what will happen eventually is that they will be so overused that they'll become ineffective. And the people who are most badly affected by the inefficacy of certain drugs that we need are going to be the most vulnerable members of society. So precisely for the sake of the most vulnerable members of society, we say, no, your autonomy is going to be denied here. Your autonomy is going to be limited according to the social yes. interests that we have 
into society. That's just that's just one very moderate example. We could go much further with regards to things like um, uh, if if I, for example, were to rescue you, you wanted to end your own life, you jumped into a river, and I rescued you from the river. Would we say, oh, how how could you do that? You you violated this person's bodily autonomy. No, I would be lauded for having done so because we think actually there is a general there's a personal good here. The saving this person's life overrides their personal autonomous choice to try to end their own lives. And there are plenty of other cases we can take uh, like that, which, which even extends to more controversial areas. Um, sorry, did you want to interrupt there? Sorry, I just want to say, yeah, so, but the advocate uh, might say, yeah, but say with the case of drugs, we have made a, a decision for societal or social reasons that we're going to live the access to antibiotics, but also to things like heroin or cocaine or cannabis, whatever. However, while once upon a time those were not controlled, well, it was true at one stage. You, for example, you, you could, in theory, be charged with attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. Suicide was illegal. Sure. But we have moved away from that. Now there is there's no legal penalty or control over somebody killing themselves. So while we might laud the person that jumped in and save the person from the river the person who's taken out of the river isn't exposed isn't going to be exposed to criminal That's prosecution right. Right. so in that sense we have said okay um your life is yours mm -hmm. and if you choose to dispose of it then you can so in a sense they were saying there is a right to suicide Ah, oh, no, there's a difference there, isn't there, between a right is, and a liberty. Yeah. So, for example, if I want to try to end my own life, it's, it, the state has decided, both in the United Kingdom as in Ireland, in the United Kingdom it was the Suicide Act 1961. In your case, it was an act which was passed in, I believe, 1993, and I think it was something like the Criminal Justice Suicide Act uh, of 1993. In both cases, what was decided was that actually we don't need to have a common law crime of attempted suicide or suicide because there's no purchase, that there's, there's no purpose to that. It doesn't actually achieve anything. Uh, someone who is so driven that they were to, to, to self-destruction that they would try to commit suicide is someone who's severely mentally ill. This person is not going to, there's no, no, nothing within the common good that will be affected by criminalizing someone who has tried to end their own life. So what we have is a pragmatic liberty to end your own life. But at the same time, both those acts, both the 1961 British Act and the 1993 Irish Act, both criminalized assisting suicide very specifically, very expli explicitly, I should say. And the reason why they did that was to send a social signal. The social signal that was sent was, OK, we don't want to criminalize people who are mentally ill for, for doing something whilst they are mentally ill. But neither do we want to give any signal that this is a somehow acceptable idea, nor do we want to say uh, that there is something laudable or, or that there is even need a right to end your own life or to be helped to end your own life or to try to help somebody else end their own life. So there's a very difference, dif big difference between a right and a liberty. A liberty is simply allowing someone to do something irrespective of whether or we think you should do it. A right is when you actually have um, a legal protection from, uh, from uh, being effectively prevented by the state from doing what you want to do, such as the right to freedom of speech or the right to life. Or uh, The right to life is actually a protective right. It's a negative right, the right to not be hurt, to be killed, uh, not to be harmed. But there is no uh, at all, there is no parallel right to end your own life. In fact, the European Court of Human Rights has never found that the right to life extends to the right to have the power over your own life so as to end it. Uh, so as the Irish Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera. So there are plenty, uh, although there are other jurisdictions which have held to that, for example, in Canada, which is unfortunately a bioethical basket case, and uh, we can go on to what the effects have been there. Um, nonetheless, the idea in principle that there is somehow a right to end your own life such that you have a right to be enabled to end your own life or to have the, or the right to have your physician end your life for you simply doesn't follow at all. That would be a positive right as opposed to a simple negative liberty or freedom. And so there's a big, big, big difference there. Uh, just because you have the right or, the, or even just the pragmatic liberty to do something does not mean you have the right to be enabled to do it. So there are plenty of little uh, of, of concepts that need to be distinguished there. Um, a, a liberty oh, okay. from, but also a negative right from a positive right as well. Positive right, yeah. It's brilliant. Now, it, it, it just occurs to me, uh, you, we said that there's a move to move the language from the discussion of assisted suicide to assisted dying, because there does seem to be a, a strange dissonance in the idea that on one hand, we would actually set up a legal framework 
for suicide. When, on the other hand, in Ireland, certainly, and I'm, I, I believe, I'm sure this is true across the developed world, we increasingly are spending time and resources and concern and worry about the increase in suicides. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, in young men or whatever group it is, we regard suicide as a bad thing, mm -hmm. as a problem which needs to be confronted, as a disease which needs to be cured. And we try to put in place also, and we worry about it, and we talk about it, and we say that we have to do this. And then at the same time, we're putting up and saying, well, actually, in this case, this is, it, suicide's a good thing. Mm. And, and that dissonance, do you think, in a sense, there's an awareness that this is a dissonance, this is a, an apparent contradiction. So they want to move away from the idea of suicide to assist dying because of that. Mm. The notion that, that even though this, the, the notion assisted dying is a kind of a strange idea in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the idea that I always um, discourage anyone from using the term assisted dying, I always say, don't try to use the other side's language, because this is a propagandistic term. When someone says assisted dying, what they're trying to sell to you is the idea that, well, the dying process has, has started, so all you're really doing is assisting someone along the route of dying. Um, no, um, this this is a misleading term because ultimately what you are really assisting someone to do is end their own life. And there is a word for ending your own life and the word is suicide. And they want to get away from that because they know that there are moral uh, that there are moral implications there. They want to move away from that. They want it to sound nice and cuddly and, and fluffy and, and inoffensive. So they try to neuter the offence of suicide by saying, oh, no, no, it's not assisted suicide. It's assisted dying because these people are dying anyway. Of course, the fallacy in this is that we are all dying in, in, in a very proper sense. We are, we're all going, we're all heading towards our own natural demise. Um, so, so assisting someone to die uh, doesn't really make a lot of rational sense. It's really assisting someone to bring the dying, dying process, not to a conclusion, but rather to cheat the dying process by trying to end their own lives for themselves by the ingestion of barbiturates or some other drug that will, that will bring a quick end. Um, they think it's going to bring a quick end. I mean, actually, there's there's no guarantee of that. There are cases in America where they've had some very, very nasty ends, um, including with barbiturates. But irrespective, that idea of assisted dying is a way of trying to obviate and, and remove the moral offence of suicide itself. And of course, that's relevant because when you actually have certain jurisdictions where they have introduced assisted suicide or euthanasia, you've actually found that, that there is um, a moderate amount of evidence and there's an increasing amount of evidence that it actually does increase suicide rates per se. Now, you'll see this, um, and in fact, the, the evidence for this, and again, this is not a, an absolutely completely simply established uh, correlation, but it is a correlation that exists, and it is something which, for which there is moderate evidence. And you'll see this within the latest paper, which we're going to be bringing out uh, in the Anscombe Centre, um, in the next few days, in fact, possibly tomorrow, uh, which is precisely the presentation of this evidence by David Albert Jones, who's the director of the Anscombe Centre. Um, so there is a, a real connection here, um, whether it be cultural or whether it be simply by the loss of, of a, a degree of moral stigma attached to suicide and the concept of suicide. Um, that means that there is a connection between the legalization of euthanasia and suicide and suicide itself. But it was not only that, but I would argue that because of that, and also because of the cultural signal that it sends, which is effectively that it's okay to try to end your own life, which is the total opposite of the signal we've been trying, as you've rightly pointed out, uh, to send over the last few decades. We've been trying to say, look, this is a serious mental health issue. This is a serious public health and mental health issue. We want to be discouraging people from trying to end their own lives as much as possible. That's why we have suicide prevention strategies by the various different governments uh, across the Western world. The cultural signal that that sends is don't do this. For goodness sake, let us help you. Let us provide the support that, we, that you need so that you don't end your own life. But by legalizing it, by saying, actually, you can end your own life, we will enable you to do so. That's a fundamentally contradictory cultural signal that is sent. And in fact, there's a, a very, um, very good argument set forward by Professor Jonathan Herring at Oxford University. You can look up uh, his uh, work on this, in which he argues that actually that there is a, a right to suicide prevention. So far from there being a right to being assisted to commit your own to commit suicide, there is actually a right to be prevented from committing suicide. And that is a positive right that comes forward from the right to life itself. If you are in such a state, in such a condition, 
but or mentally speaking, that your personal autonomy this is one of the other reasons why the autonomy argument is so bogus, because someone who's wanting to own their own life is by definition in the least autonomous state they could possibly be as an individual. But if by virtue of the, their compromised autonomy, they want to end their own life, then actually they have a right for society and certainly governments to, to stop them from doing so and certainly to discourage them from doing so, which is legalizing assisted suicide and euthanasia fundamentally contradicts. So, so far from assisted suicide and euthanasia being something which is a right, it's actually a contradiction of a right in the broader sense. So in a sense, he's, you know, Herring is saying that uh, when a person finds them to be suicidal, and in such severe psychic difficulty, then they have a reasonable right to expect protection, yeah. in a sense, that they Very will be protected so. from the consequences of any actions they may take in a situation where, and this is something you might talk about a little later, as the, 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 the notion of consent becomes a very, very woolly of idea indeed. Consent uh, and full understanding and knowledge and to the extent that we, these acts are free mm -hmm. acts, uh, acts, rational acts and consensual acts. I mean, I know there are many problems to uh, psychiatrists I, I know here who would, would say that suicide is in fact always an act of madness. In a, in a, that uh, to construe it as a rational act, it, 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 well, it, it, it's vanishingly rare, but certainly. Yeah. So um, if we can just move it back a little bit in history, um, the places which were, I suppose, most famously associated with uh, euthanasia are so the, the, hot, uh, the Netherlands, then mm -hmm. Belgium, and they've been constantly in the news. Now, if I remember well, the, it, it comes into the, into the, into the low country, because also Luxembourg, strangely, I wonder why that little triangle there, it's an odd thing. Uh, it starts through the courts rather than through legislation. And then it, as it comes in through it, it comes in through court, shall we say, up judgments there, then legislation follows it in a sense. But how has it evolved? I mean, have we seen a situation where, it's, where we, it begins in a very narrow form and then evolves and broadens? Or is it much the same today as it was 20 years ago? No, it does. It does expand. I mean, the, the actual origin of assisted suicide or, or euthanasia really does depend depend on the individual jurisdiction. So only in a few countries has it been driven by jurisprudence as opposed to legislation proper. The most famous case, of course, being Canada. Uh, Canada has, and this is a very much a constitutional issue, so Canada has what's called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So it's supposed to be based, Canada, on the Westminster model. It has its own, you know, a House of Commons and a Senate as opposed to a House of Lords. Um, and it's, it's based, based on that Westminster system. But what it's decided to do is create a kind of hybrid with the Washington system of having a Supreme Court and also having a sort of pseudo constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which allows the court to interpret that constitution such that it can read into it, just as, for example, the U US Supreme Court did with Roe v. Wade in the abortion issue, uh, it can read into it rights that are not expressly set out there. And so consequently, that's exactly why Canada has no abortion law at all, because of it, back in the 1980s, they read into the right to life, perversely, the right to take life. Um, uh, and the right to so, so-called privacy and all these other kind of so-called rights that are meant to, <laughs> meant to be there explicitly, but are in fact read into there by the Supreme Court. So that, that constitutional issue has led them to have a situation where just as they read into the Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, the right to abortion, so now they've also read a right to assisted suicide and euthanasia, precisely again on the right to life. So in other words, there's an idea that because you have a right to life, you have the right to end your own life. And therefore, you, there can be no state legislation stopping you from uh, or stopping you from trying to procure the ending of your own life by a physician. Um, so that's that's in the case of Canada. But in most countries, and include, that includes Belgium, that includes the Netherlands, that includes Oregon, um, either euthanasia and assisted suicide or just assisted suicide on its own, which is more the American model, because America doesn't have any euthanasia laws. It only has assisted suicide for now. I'm not quite sure there's any reason why they couldn't have uh, a euthanasia law, but they haven't uh, thus far. I'm pretty sure it, it probably could be the case that individual American states could say, well, we will exclude euthanasia from our laws against murder, uh, whatever they may, they may be, because those are state level laws, irrespective and irrespective of whatever federal, federal effect there may be. 
Um, that's been largely driven by either referendums uh, in certain cases, because they have a number of referendums which have allowed for euthanasia to suicide. For example, uh, New Zealand was very much referendum led, or it's been individual uh, individual states having legislation. So Oregon introduced legislation, I think, although, although I think that wasn't possibly led by referendum as well. Uh, the Australian states have all been led by uh, legislation. Belgium was uh, led by legislation, as was the Netherlands, as was Luxembourg. So a lot of these countries, mainly it's been politicians pushing it, but with uh, the, the knowledge that actually there, there won't be a massive public outcry. Um, so that's where it's mainly uh, led. The only place where it's really stayed it's in terms of assisted suicide as assisted suicide has been uh, Oregon. And the reason uh, for that arguably is partly constitutional, again, because uh, there'd be federal legislation coming in at some point if you're going to legalise euthanasia proper. But also, I think, because they, they decided that they because they had a system where and, you, and you'll look at you'll see this if you actually look into the Oregon system. The Oregon system has no real oversight. There's nothing to stop a doctor from doing a lot of things uh, if he really wants to or she really wants to, because there's nothing that mandates uh, as in obliges doctors to report the fullness of what they're doing. So consequently, we don't know what's going on in Oregon. That's why it's such a wonderful case for the, the other side, because we have such a, a so, much, so much little knowledge, so little knowledge of what's going on but beyond the very basic reporting they allow for in their, their annual statistical reports. We, we simply don't know what the, uh, the real life uh, situation is. In fact, this was uh, noted by the Oregonian, which is their statewide newspaper in 2008, in an, in, a, in an editorial which said that the legislation had been constructed in such a way uh, so as, as if it were to cover abuse. So we don't know what's going on in Oregon. We know more, however, about what's going on in places like Belgium and the Netherlands. And what we have seen in places like Belgium and the Netherlands is that even though the legislation has not radically changed, the, the application of the legislation has been far, far wider than simply euthanasia or assisted suicide for people who are simply terminally ill, uh, who are dying. And anyway. so it's been ex extended to people who are either very, very severely depressed uh, or very severely compromised by some psychological state or were disabled in cases. So, I mean, the, the most famous case, I, I guess, um, is Godleva de Troyer. She was um, 64, otherwise quite healthy. She had she was living with depression and she was killed by lethal injection at her own request in a Brussels hospital uh, 2012, I believe it was, despite at least two of the experts who, who assessed her agreeing that she was not beyond uh, psychological treatment. Um, and her son, Tom Mortier, who was was not contacted um, after his mother had been euthanized, he actually um, he actually only knew that she had been euthanized when the hospital rang him uh, to retrieve her body from the morgue. And he's taken the case of her uh, her treatment all the way to the ECHR. Um, but she she was just had she just simply had depression. Another case was uh, Tina Nice. I mean, Tina Nice uh, was depressed after the breakup of a relationship, but she had a, a terrible life up to that point. She had been, uh, she'd suffered domestic violence. Uh, she was worked, she had worked in prostitution um, and she was euthanized in 2009, not on the basis of, of any of that, but on the basis that she had autism. So simply having autism was the basis um, for that. And, and her parents and her two sisters did exceed, succeed after nine years of effort, um, in having charges of, of unlawful poisoning as it is in Belgian law. Um, laid against the psychiatrists and the two doctors who allowed for all of that. Um, all three were acquitted, however, in 2020. So a new trial against the doctor who committed the fraud, as they saw it, um, of her euthanasia was is now ongoing. I think I don't I don't think it's reached its um, its final terminus yet. But that was that's just autism. So you've got depression, you've had autism. Um, there was uh, there were two uh, twins, Mark and Eddie uh, Verbesum. Uh, they were both 45. Uh, they were both deaf. And they were actually going blind and they were euthanized because they were so afraid of not only being deaf, but also blind as well. So a severe, a severe disability in this case was the basis for their euthanasia. Um, Nathan Verhelst, well, born Nancy, so Na Nancy Verhelst originally, uh, she was euthanized in 2013 after a series of uh, failed gender reassignment surgeries. So in other words, someone who is a uh, transsexual and who wanted the cosmetic surgery that will alter um, their body, um, the, the, the surgery itself did not lead them to uh, lead her uh, to to be to not be depressed any longer about her condition. So consequently, she was euthanized. Um, that's another example. So Angie is another one, a Dutch woman who was uh, euthanized for psychological pain because she was sexually exploited by her psychiatrist who was treating her anorexia. 
Um, there's another man called Mark Van Langerdijk. Uh, he was a Dutch alcoholic. So he escaped his condition by, uh, by that means as well. So there are so many examples, and they're awful examples. Uh, very Isn't often, we've been horribly abused, and it's covering that abuse and allowing for people to be killed on the basis that they have been abused. Um, but isn't it, we, we, couldn't we say that in fact, uh, if the principle is that we have the right to expect this help mm. because of pain, that that, um, when this was framed originally, most of the time, as you said, people were thinking about people who are terminally ill, perhaps people who are suffering from cancer or from some other illness, where um, pain control was failing and they were just in continual and irredeemable pain. So this was seen as just the humane thing to do. The, the, the common cliche is you, I mean, you wouldn't do it to an animal. You wouldn't allow yeah. an animal to suffer like this. But if you accept that principle, surely then psychic pain is just as real as physical pain. Absolutely. And well, very yeah, often it's intractable. So if someone's in pain, well, why wouldn't you? Precisely so. Uh, what, what why you, would, why what would you, you not? What's the basis is pain. What's the, limited, what's the, per, what's the, yeah. the basis for limiting uh, the application of assisted suicide or euthanasia to any single group? Because if the right to die is truly a right, then literally no one uh, doesn't possess it. Literally everyone has the right to die if it truly exists. And there's no reason, no rational reason why you can say, well, we'll, we'll give it to the, the terminally ill, but not to the people who are simply chronically ill, for example. Uh, and we certainly have no basis for denying it to people who are in what, what, again, as I pointed out earlier on, people who are in severe uh, existential suffering due to the fact that they have locked in syndrome or para, you know, paraplegia and the like. Um, this is despite the fact that actually there are plenty of people who have locked in syndrome who, who actually live happy lives. I'm, I, do, I don't want to present, the, present it as if people who are paraplegic are just universally, uh, horror, hopelessly in despair, mm -hmm. because that's not true. But irrespective, even if, it, you know, even if we discount that, there is no basis for rational limitation of of assisted suicide euthanasia once you've granted the premise and that's exactly why the other side are trying to just introduce the camel's nose under the tent as i say once you've admitted that fundamental premise there's no reason not to extend it so it will either be extended re really by medical practice and then the law will catch up with that or it will be extended by legislation because either the courts will force them to do it which is what's happened in, in canada they've gone from saying well no we don't want to have people who are psychologically ill to accepting that we can have people who are psychologically ill we don't want to have the disabled oh we will accept that the disabled can be euthanized it just extends itself either by practice or by legislation um one one of the other will catch up and that just means that the the when someone tries to sell you the idea of assisted dying on the basis of, oh, it's only going to be for this group over here, without accepting that there will be real life consequences in terms of its obvious extension, its incremental extension, they're not being, they either don't know what they're doing or they're being deliberately very dishonest. Uh, and you need well, to be very clear about what the implications have been in foreign jurisdictions like Canada, like Belgium, like, like the Netherlands and others. And we'll see what happens in Australia and New Zealand. It I suppose it's a kind of weaponized compassion, isn't it? I mean, where we take the people's natural sense of compassion and we use it, but in this, it would seem rather inappropriate fashion. But isn't it also that we're now moving, we're not, we're moving not just from pain now, but also that people can, in a sense, make dispositions for future assisted suicide on the basis of an anticipated pain. So mm -hmm. that people can write wills or write living wills where they say that if they should, for example, if, if you, you receive a, 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 a diagnosis mm -hmm. for uh, Alzheimer's or for yeah. a, a form of dementia, that you can say, okay, when I reach this point, then I want to, I want to be helped on my way. But the problem is we're, you're, you're, at that point, you're not even conceding to pain which is present, but rather a fear of something which may come in, which may not even, in fact, be a pain at all. But then we get into this weird situation. There was, there was, there was a case with right, the rights or wrongs, uh, maybe complicated, but of a, a woman who, who had expressed a wish uh, that 
when uh, before her dementia had taken place, had taken hold, shall we say, to, to for us to be euthanized. And but then at the moment when she was actually suffering from it, resisted. Yeah. And they had to hold her and down. They had to hold her down. And frankly, the, the descriptions were kind of horrific. It was just horrible. Yeah. yeah. And the decision, the legal decision was, well, she was no longer in a position to make an informed, to give informed consent for her previous consent. But how can you give informed consent about a, a state? But when you're not in that state, you have no real capacity to understand or comprehend what that state would be. And yeah. then you don't have a right to change your mind, bizarrely. Mm. But is there an element, and maybe I'm being excessively cynical here, that, that it seems to me that we're moving, I think it's rarely go univocally, they're very often we, we, they're, they come in cohorts. So it's compassion, there's pain, there's the autonomy, but increasingly, as our, we, we're faced with aging populations, we're faced with the, pro the problem increasingly of long-term care and of large numbers suffering with maybe vascular dementia or Alzheimer's, you know. There's a slight, is there, is there a concern here that economics, the economics of healthcare are starting to become, come to this? And also that older people are, are going to be made to feel that they are in fact, a burden, a burden on their family. Yeah. Which there's always been a sense of that. People have always had that worry, but also, a, a, also on the stage, there was a phrase used by a politician here, ref, to, a rather shameful one, referring to people as bed blockers. Yeah, yeah, very much. And so well, uh, we've seen that very much in uh, in Canada. So I think uh, it was in October 2020. So this is during uh, COVID times, which is even more disturbing in a, in a certain way. Um, the Canadian Parliamentary Budget Office, um, the PBO released um, a cost estimate report for Bill C-7. That was the one that expanded euthanasia and suicide in Canada beyond the terminally ill, right? So we originally per terminally ill, then it was expanded to other people such as those with um, severe, uh, well, with, with psychological illness, for example. Um, so this looks at projected made medical assistance in dying deaths in 2021, as well as likely costs and savings due to them. And it estimated that under the law as it stood, 6,465 people would die by maid in 2021. That was 2.2% of all deaths with net health care savings, quote unquote, of $86.9 million. And that expanding the law would add 1,164 deaths in the first year alone, leading to health care savings of $149 million. So all of this was basically saying that um, you, we can save an extra $87 million by having American dollars, um, by having uh, by having euthanasia instead of suicide, uh, because again, the bed blockers go. The, the people who would otherwise be cared for by the medical system are not there. We're not wasting our resources on them. And not, that, not that they put it in this terms, but they did to put it in the terms of costs and savings. And so therefore, this is a net benefit. So not nearly the justification of euthanasia instead of suicide on the basis of autonomy or dignity or any of these other things, but on the basis of, of well, it saves us money. Um, and that, of course, is going to be not merely a, a broad because this is this is just a parliamentary budget office saying this, but you can think about what would happen on the lower level of healthcare in hospitals uh, where we do see doctors and nurses regarding patients eventually as just bed blockers, as just people who are wasting resources of the health service or the hospital, or whatever, and saying, well, why don't we just euthanize this person and get them out of the way? Um, and, uh, and be able to uh, look after someone, use those resources to look after someone who has much more of a chance. Um, even worse than that, I think there was um, a cl there are cases in Belgium, I think there were cases in Belgium where, yes, that's right, where they had, um, if, I, if I can find it here, uh, the, yes, the research that was found in, I think it was, yes, it was 2011, um, that showed that significant proportions of organ donors, and that was including 23.5% of all lung donors, had been euthanized. What this did was it raised concerns that uh, patients would be given an emotional inducement to be killed mm -hmm. because they could have better use by being euthanized and harvested. So the idea is this, you, you've got a, a sort of a patient who is on their last legs, or at least they think they're on their last legs, or the doctors may think they're on their last legs. And so the doctor comes along to them and says, well, you know, you've had a good innings. Um, why don't we end it now? And we will take your organs and you'll have a one last really good use of your life. Um, and so people, you know, the idea is they've been wheeled into one theatre, they've been euthanized, and they've been immediately wheeled into the next theatre to have their organs harvested. And the reason for that being, of course, 
if you want to harvest organs, it has to be really immediate. There are certain organs yeah. that will not last beyond you know 20 minutes. So you need to be very, very quick. And it's just a means of doing that. So we're seeing the instrumentalization of human beings, either for organ harvesting or for the saving of medical costs. And that's exactly the kind of thing that happens when you have a culture, a medical culture in particular, that is so dehumanized, that's so used to killing individual human beings, that they can say, well, OK, we, we might as well... Uh, you might, I would say weaponize, but you can, I would generally more, um, more, more objectively say instrumentalize the process um, of killing. Yeah, I mean, leaving aside obviously the, the high moral value that we place on recycling today, yeah, and that seems to be just the ultimate kind. In this sense, the, the very core of the problem, there are all sorts of practical problems and indeed moral problems. When we say, we talk about, say, the right to a society, what we're actually saying is we can make a demand on somebody else. Mm -hmm. We can, you're, you're, you're making a demand on a doctor or a nurse or a, or a medical system mm -hmm. to kill you. Yeah. And it seems to be very hard to make that jump to say that I have the right to ask someone to be complicit in my killing. But then if we, even if we, we stand back, how does, does, does that have an effect on the on the whole of the profession on the whole on shall we say the model of care does it start to change or to corrode how we see i mean to be honest, I mean, the first principle of medicine was of course do no harm that mm. seems to be obviously contradicted and, and, and disposed of here but if we start to say to people well, you, you, we have to get once upon a time it was a principle of surgery that you absolutely it was unethical. It was unethical to remove healthy tissue, for example. You couldn't yeah, just yeah. remove uh, 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 an organ or a limb or yeah. something that was healthy, even if the patient deeply desired it. That's gone. And now we're saying that we 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 doctors will be in, complicit in this. They will have to. Maybe there may be con some protections for for conscience, but we'll see. But just do you think that this has ultimately, from the practical side where we've seen it in Bel in Belgium and in the Netherlands and other places, has it changed the model of care? Well, I mean, I, I, I just uh, a little codicil there. I would point out that we are inconsistent on this point as to whether we can do harm in order to, to so-called benefit the patient on an elective level. So, for example, we do not allow to this day, we do not allow either in Ireland or the UK, uh, you to if someone has bodily identity dysphoria, so they want to chop off an arm, right? Uh, yeah. As some people with BID do, um, and if you presented with that to a doctor, they would say, "No, no, I'm not going to tack your arm off." Uh, and if you were to accede to that as a doctor, then you would be prosecuted for a grievous bodily harm, as it is in England. I'm not quite sure what the uh, I can't remember what the alternative crime is in in Ireland, but uh, you would probably be before then struck off the medical register. Um, yeah. That's that's bad. Now, weirdly, I don't want to go into this other subject, but weirdly, we do allow it for um, chopping off genitals when it comes to transsexuality uh, and all that kind of stuff. But yes. that's a whole other issue. Uh, we're inconsistent on this point, is my point. Um, so when people want to argue for autonomy uh, going this far, that we, we as a society do not agree really where that autonomy line really lies. And I would say we should actually be on, on the side of protecting patients. But to answer your question more directly, does it affect the medical system, the medical culture and, and the way that uh, doctors look at things? As early as 2005 in Holland, 500 patients were given a lethal injection without request. That was found in a study by the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007. Without request without request so this is involuntary euthanasia what had happened is the doctor or doctors had said well you know they, they were used to ending the life of their patients they decided they could arrogate to themselves the right to say well this patient they've had a good innings i'll just end it now for them um and an another study in june 2010 this was in uh the canadian medical association journal looked at uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia in Belgium. It looks at 208 euthanasia deaths in Flanders and it found that 66, which was 32%, right, almost a total third of the euthanasia deaths were done without any explicit request or consent. And even sometimes, even admitted by nurses as opposed to doctors in some of the cases of euthanasia, where it said they were operating, quote, beyond the legal margins of their profession. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not only the legal, but the ethical. But this is because one can infer the system itself, the, the medical culture has been affected so badly by the allowing of normalized killing that 
do not just do doctors, but nurses themselves feel the ability to arrogate, like I say, to themselves, the ability in certain cases to decide for the patient. Um, so it's it's incredibly dangerous. This is the thing. The, the, the case against euthanasia suicide has to be put in terms of not just the common good, although yes, but actually public safety. That This is hugely dangerous to people, particularly those who are the most vulnerable, which is by definition people who are very severely terminally ill or chronically ill or disabled or elderly or any of these other um, groups of people who are the most obviously affected by this. So we really do need to take this incredibly seriously. And yes, the, the, the evidence does show that, I mean, going forward with also with the issue of, um, uh, in continuity rather with, with what I pointed out with regards to organ donation, which is not donation in this case, it's just organ retrieval based on the moral bullying of the patient. All of this is part of evidence which shows that euthanasia and assisted suicide has a very pernicious effect on the, the attitude that doctors themselves have and the relationship between the doctor and the patient. I would be very curious, and there's no reason why you should know this, and there probably isn't any research, and I may be completely wrong, but I would be very curious to, to see if there was any kind of a congruity of, of profile of patients that were euthanized without consent. I would be curious to know how many, how many of these patients were these people who received regular visits, for example or came from families who had who were educated or politically connected for example i i, I would be curious to know if, if these weren't people who didn't have anybody visiting perhaps didn't have family who weren't yeah. very powerful because i am mean, completely wrong but i'm just speculating my experience is that these things tend to happen to poor to poor people and to powerless people and people yeah. who don't have any ability to advocate for them exactly. or to vindicate them afterwards so there's a sense exactly. of what we can get away with here Maybe be wrong, but I suspect, sadly, that that is what's going on. That's just right. before we, we, we tie up here, this is not a philosophical question, but it's just curiosity. I, I, I wonder, if with these bioethical issues, very often, we, we, argue, we can argue both on a practical level and on a philosophical level, but isn't there also a level that for, for people who are not who are at a distance, people who are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and who are healthy and are really don't want to have to deal with the elderly aunt or whatever, that this is perceived as something which is useful. Mm. And that in a sense, what we have, we're seeing is a process where life is being desacralized. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's very difficult in a society where life is increasingly seen less as something sacred but rather just a function of biology rather to protect ultimately to 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 to, to keep the dam up hmm. do you think there's anything to that i do think that's true i do think that the sanctity i mean I, I have a bit of a problem here because i don't like the um the use of language within um uh, shall i say anglophone circles but also beyond that um sort of the circles that you you and i are, are part of i don't like the overuse of the term life because i don't think i think life is a bit too a uh, generalistic and it's a bit too vague i think that when you're yeah. engaging in communication i'm a communicator I, i'm a i'm a uh, an apologist i go on tv radio do debates this that and the other i'm a media and communications manager um for me communication is really important in communication one of the key points of communication is specificity and mm -hmm. and earthiness you want to be as grounded as humanly possible so i don't like the term pro-life weirdly enough I, I find the term too generalistic i think it's, it's talking about what is effectively uh, an abstract concept life but we don't of yes. course believe that life has intrinsic value really because i mean bacteria are life and they don't have we don't say that they have value uh mm -hmm. I, i'm for one eat meat um i for one am in favor of just wars when there are indeed just wars i'm in favor of killing in self-defense i mean there, there are all sorts of cases in which i can think that there are justifications for the taking of a human life and i don't certainly think that life per se in any sense has value and, and in fact nobody does even vegans eat plants right which is a species of life yes. so so life isn't really helpful as a concept. It doesn't tell you what you're really against, so, nor does it really tell you what you're about. I think that the that's why I use the term in the abortion debate, anti-abortion. That's why I use the term in the, apart from the fact that that's actually what the other side are going to call us anyway, so we might as well own it and, and, and redeem it. 
Uh, and I think the anti-slavery movement was called the anti-slavery movement. Why would we not want to use the same kind of uh, language? It tells us what mm -hmm. we're against, which is the thing itself. We're going to have a yes. discussion about the thing that we're against, which is so gruesome and horrible that the other side don't want to talk about it. That's why they tend to try to keep it on the terms of choice versus life, because these are so vague, abstract concepts that you never end up talking about the evil itself. Yeah. So there's all of that. But in terms of euthanasia suicide as well, uh, if you talk about the thing itself rather than you know, vague, you know, more, more general concepts about life and its sanctity, I think that's you're better off uh, on a communications level. But on the on the specific point, I actually think that what's more important to talk about is humanity. That it's something about being human that's actually truly valuable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the life of a human being that's really valuable. And what we have to do is reestablish why we think human beings per se and uniquely have value. Now, we can put that in a theological sense. We can talk about the Imago Dei, the image of God. But we can also talk, and I think that the church is historic, uh, and I'm going to come from a Catholic perspective here, uh, but also from a more, again, apologetic and, and rational perspective. I think that the historic way we've gone about these things is by talking about the concept of natural rights. So, for example, when, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Ptolemy de las Casas, he was a, Fra Ptolemy de las Casas was one of the great champions of the Amerindians who were being yes. enslaved and used by the Spanish. And he and a few other people like uh, Francisco de Vitoria and others, parts of the School of Salamanca, they were the people who founded, they were, these were all Dominican Catholic priests, right? Uh, and friars, they were the ones who established the idea of natural rights. And the idea of a natural right is that there is such thing as the natural law, and the natural law refers to the the moral norms that we discover by reason alone, by looking at the various faculties of our nature and discerning that there is such a thing as the good for us, which is the fulfillment of the purposes of these faculties. So, for example, the good for me is to eat moderate amounts of nutritious food and not to uh, you know, completely mm -hmm. binge on donuts or else to to engage in, in bulimic uh, behavior. I realize that's also a medical uh, mental health issue, but nonetheless, the choice between those two extremes is vicious and the virtue is in the mean, which is eating moderate amounts of nutritious food. Those moral duties to flourish, to fulfill the, the, the purposes of our nature, becomes actually also a duty on you and me to not, for example, kill each other or attack each other or to maim each other, to, to do anything harmful to one another, because my moral duty to flourish is also your moral duty to not stop me from flourishing. And that is the expression, a fundamental basic expression of this thing we call the right to life. It's a natural right because it flows from the duties that flow from the moral norms in our rational human nature. And that's where we get the idea of natural rights. And natural rights is just simply another word for human rights. So this is the fundamental basic uh, and very Catholic, but really much more basically Aristotelian Western uh, tradition of, of human rights. This is the only rational metaphysical basis for that. And that's the case we should make when we try to re-establish what this is, rather than talking, in my opinion, this is purely my opinion, so take it or leave it, but rather than talk about vague generalities and abstract concepts, what we should do is go back to what is the fundamental case for human dignity and human rights, which is founded within this, with, within this metaphysic, this rational metaphysic, and say, and therefore, this is what flows from there. And then you're actually bringing people back to what they say they believe in to begin with, which is human rights. I don't know many people who reject the idea of human rights. Maybe certain academics do. You only find these people in, in ivory towers. But most people will accept that there's such a thing as human rights. So you have to challenge them to say, OK, but well, why do you think that? Well, what is the rational basis for that? And when you provide them with what has been the historical rational basis for that, then you can lead them through all the consequences thereof, including the negative rights to life of, for example, every human being, such as the unborn child, but also such as the positive right to be prevented from ending your own life due to your compromised condition. And that's the ball game. That is the, 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 the real discussion. So when we're talking, when we're going fundamentally very, very much more basically back, yes, there is a, a theological element to this that people have lost this idea of the Margot Day and the sacredness of, of human beings on that level. Actually, much more fundamentally, they're not in keeping with the philosophical basis that has proceeded from civil Western civilization itself and which has existed within Catholic culture, which is this idea of the natural law and the natural rights that come from that. So when we challenge people on a philosophical basis as well as a theological basis, I think they will be forced yeah. to come to the same moral framework that we do. And 
As a consequence of the undermining of the individual's natural human rights, we also see, and it's uh, ultimately, and I think something that is missed is an attack also then on on the common good. Yeah. Because uh, where there is, even if we were to allow that there might be one or two or three cases where you could build up an extraordinarily strong case mm -hmm. where it would be licit and reasonable and compassionate and just to allow this, but to actually frame legislation that would undermine that basic principle of protecting of that individual human right would ultimately lead to damage, a wider damage with to the common good. So uh, I think Aquinas says you know, that we have the right to not to obey bad laws. Yeah. But even bad laws we should obey because it's only in the extreme case that we can obey the bad, we can refuse because the value of the law is so high yeah. that sometimes we have to simply suffer under bad laws rather than do bad, actually break that compact that we have, which says we should obey the law because lawfulness and the rule of law is such an important concept and so important to, to yeah. the good of the society to them good and in this case also that once we break that fundamental compact then the consequences like you said 500 patients in 2005 yeah. euthanized euthanized killed yeah. yeah without asking for it and that seems to be that just is where we go and it's it's magical thinking to think that if it goes if if it goes, we can be, we will be different. Mm. We won't do that. We will be better. We will mind. We will have all sorts of protections. But once you change that culture, I think, is that, I think, if I understand, yeah. once, once you change that culture, but then the culture is gone. Mm. And that's where we, we, we will end up. Absolutely. And I don't, I, I never really understand why people in individual jurisdictions think that somehow they are unique. Somehow the other people have had these problems. Oh, but we're different. Uh, and I think the more that Western countries do this kind of thing, the, 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 the more that the other Western countries have to realize, yeah, they're not really that much different from us. You know, Canada is not yeah. that much different. The, you know, Oregon is not that much different. Belgium and the Netherlands are not that much different. Um, so th why, why should you be so special? Why should Ireland or the UK or anybody else be so special as to avoid the problems that have been demonstrably the case? In other jurisdictions where they have tried to, to, to try, well, they've tried where they've tried this, and of course, one one of my favourite quotes um, about this, I can't remember it exactly. It's from um, Lord Williams Voice to Mouth, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, he said something along the lines of, you know, when you when you introduce the right of of some very very strong minded people um, to to avail themselves of this service, um, it will allow for those who are much less strong. Um, to be abused on that same basis. So you might, you, you, it's all very well to say, oh, well, what about this poor person over here who, who really, really wants to end their own life, but they can't actually do it. They don't have the ability to, they, they haven't been given the drugs or the, the doctor hasn't come around with a syringe yet uh, to do so. It's all very well for the person who's really, really self-willed, the person who is the, the most par profoundly powerful personal autonomy, not that you could ever know whether they have that really. But what about the many, 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 many more people who, by virtue of their disability, their social status, their, the fact that they don't really have many loved ones, if any at all, um, their, their, and actually just their chronic condition, just, just the, the simple physical effect of being very ill at that point. Those people who are much more vulnerable, who are much less autonomous, properly speaking, don't have the full, the full strength of autonomy, those people will be coerced. So a freedom for one person, the, 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 not even the freedom, because it's actually a positive right. The, 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 so rather than it being a freedom, it's really more an entitlement. The entitlement given to certain very confident people to end their own lives as they want is actually then the taking away of the real freedom of other people not to be just demoralized and attacked whilst they're in that state. Um, so that's that's exactly what we have to focus on, I think, is that it's all very well talking about autonomy, but you're not really talking about autonomy, properly speaking, because this isn't a freedom. It, you already have the uh, the freedom to try to end your own life without someone uh, criminalizing you for it. But much more basic than that, it's actually about the introduction of a practice which would undermine the freedom and the autonomy of others. Um, and mm -hmm. so that nothing about this really makes sense. It's really more about the cult of autonomy, uh, which is 
which is fundamentally contrary to, as you rightly point out, the common good, which let's remind ourselves what we mean by the common good. We don't simply mean the the uh, the um, the back the greatest good for the greatest number. It's not a utilitarian concept. The common good is the sum total of goods and conditions that lead to human flourishing. And so it, it's fundamentally attached, again, to this idea of the natural law, that if there is a duty to flourish, what are the sum total of goods and conditions? What are the things that we need as a society to allow everyone to flourish? So it's not just about some people over here, the small minority of very confident people. It's about everyone altogether, especially those who are the most vulnerable in society, which are much greater cohort, actually. So what about those people as well? What about the the... The kind of laws that we have need to enable the flourishing of everyone. And I would argue that there is nothing about suicidal euthanasia that really enables any flourishing. In fact, it always enables the, the end of flourishing by virtue of it killing an individual human being. And it certainly does prevent the real flourishing of plenty of people who would otherwise have maybe even decades of much of, of fulfilled lives with their loved ones, but for the fact that they'd been euthanized so early by a system that is impatient with the suffering of what seem like protracted lives and unproductive lives, lives that aren't economically worthwhile, for example. So it just enables all of this abuse and undermines the protections that are part of the common good that allow for everyone to flourish properly. Well, I think uh, for for tonight, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll draw a line there. I think perhaps maybe we'll have, if you will come back to us another time, there are a number of questions we didn't get to today. And I know that uh, a number of our viewers would like to ask, but I'd like to thank our viewers. I'd like to thank them for joining. Again, press the old subscribe button. If you can donate something there for uh, to help us in our uh, in our battles, I and can I also to, say, um, whilst, whilst you, whilst before you finish, uh, please do go to yeah. www.bioethics.org.uk. You can subscribe to uh, the Anscombe Bioethics Centre uh, digests and communications. We'll be able to inform you much better about all sorts of uh, bioethical issues, uh, and you'll be able to stay up with the latest, stay up to date with the latest research in these kind of areas. Uh, so, if you really want to be really up to date, please do subscribe to the to the Anscombe Bioethics Centre. It's really a help. Uh, and it will I'll enable ask, us to serve you better. Excellent. I'll ask Adrian to maybe to include that uh, uh, link there on it. And so, and the next, until the next time. <laughs> yes. Thanks again. Thank you, uh, Peter Williams, and thank you all. And good night and uh, safe. Stay face.